Advanced TV Herstory, where hearty discussions of all things TV draws a smart circle around the women who've made it all happen. In each installment, we'll celebrate, educate, illustrate, or analyze, all in hopes of reaching listeners with the message that TV and women are very much a part of our lives, and we like talking about them. Revisit great moments or legacies of talented women. It's all a ticket to inspiration and aspiration. So find this podcast alongside the great ones at Core Temp Arts Network, at Libsyn, Google Music, iTunes, and Auto Radio. Engage with us on Twitter. Our handle is at TV Herstory. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Enjoy. Welcome, loyal listeners, to Advanced TV Herstory. This podcast is an interview format with another podcaster. So it's not often that I actually uh, take some time to go out into the world of other podcasters and find those with the expertise, as well as sort of the delivery talent, to talk about topics that pertain to women in and of TV. But every once in a while, there's just no material out there on YouTube. There's no material at the Chicago Public Library. And I find myself thinking, I guess this is an area where we have to go to the experts then and learn more about hmm, perspective and perception and the impact that a woman in TV has made on Americans, on young people in particular. And so it's with that that we, we, Dwight Hurst, who I'm going to introduce in a second, and I are going to talk about Sherry Lewis and her three inimitable puppets, Lamb Chop and Charlie Horse and Hush Puppy, and their impact on the children of America really for uh, six decades from the 50s, kind of clear up into the early 2000s. So I am happy to welcome Dwight Hurst to this podcast. Welcome, Dwight. Hey, thank you, Cynthia. I'm super glad to be here. I am a big fan, longtime listener, first time caller. Thank you. Um, so Dwight Hurst runs a podcast called The Broken Brain, which is, it's not just sitting around talking about the Cubs and the latest movies. In fact, Dwight's podcast, The Broken Brain, is part of his clinical enterprise known as Innovate Mental Health Solutions. He is a licensed therapist. So um, Dwight, rather than my mangling your resume and how your podcast fits into the, the mental health service delivery that you do, tell us, what's your world? Yeah, yeah. I have been working in mental health treatment uh, in different capacities uh, ever since really like the turn of the century, which is <laughs> one of the most fun things we get to say in our lifespan, I think, because it makes it sound super old. Uh, I've worked in acute inpatient mental health and outpatient. And currently I have a, a private practice in, in mental health and I am a, a licensed therapist. The broken brain is meant to be like a, a weekly dose of psychotherapy or mental health. It is not therapy itself, but we talk about things like trauma, addiction, other things that, uh, you know, tie into and have to do with the, the mental health world, psych psychology world. Um, so we haven't talked about the Cubs. Occasionally you will catch me and someone else talking about a movie and the psychological implications but uh, or some other piece of pop culture. But most commonly I'm talking about therapy and talking about uh, healing from trauma, overcoming addiction, things like that. It's kind of a twofold thing to, to help promote mental health uh, literacy, just psychology, psychological literacy as well. And then to kind of just put me out there as somebody who works in mental health. Well, it's, uh, it is fascinating that you are capable of sort of delivering this in a way that is user-friendly. It is interesting to those who maybe just need a little bit more background and a little bit more education, but the idea of reading a book about it would just about overwhelm somebody. So um, I think you're delivering a really strong service and noticed that in fact, you had done a, uh, one of your uh, podcasts episodes was about the family dynamic of Little Miss Sunshine. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if I, if I do, I have uh, several podcasting friends of mine who are movie specialists or they do movie based shows or other entertainment based shows. And so in an attempt to showcase psychological dynamics in, in another little, little bit different way. I'll have some of them come on. Occasionally someone uh, who is not a mental health professional and occasionally someone who is, uh, Chris Revel and uh, David Hart from Psych uh, Pop Culture Case Study come on sometimes and they both work in mental health. But I also have some people who are just pop culture commentators, movie reviewers who sometimes come on and, and we'll talk about 
some of the dynamics that you can see and how those things are portrayed in film and how they relate to real life. So the the reason, loyal listeners, why it is that as I was mulling over the tremendous contribution that Sherry Lewis made to children's television, I started thinking, who better to understand the impact or help us better understand the impact than someone who works with children, somebody who um, has to kind of understand them at their level and work through issues that, to some degree, I think uh, Sherry Lewis provided some some safe places on TV for a period of time to let kids be kids. So that's kind of why we're here today talking. Sorry for this long introduction, but it's, uh, you know, how, how two podcasters get together, there's always a good story. And the other part of how it is that I know Dwight is that we are both podcasts from the Core Temp Arts Network. So really, it was a matter of doing some networking on Facebook. We were kind of um, joking around about something or another. And I said, I'm off to the races to try to figure out how to present Sherry Lewis. And and Dwight said, I love Sherry Lewis. And Is that how it went down? Well, something like that. So you have kids that are were born after uh, Sherry passed away. Have they ever watched Lamb Chop and the Gang? Well, no, it's funny. My kids haven't really, uh, now that you say that, that's why I was, I was trying to question the exuberance of that. I remember, <laughs> uh, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop as a big part of the culture. I myself have, uh, we, we had a, uh, CD of Lamb Chop and Sherry Lewis telling the story and singing the songs of the Nutcracker. It was a Christmas album. Oh, wow. Uh, and if anyone, any really sharp listeners out there might recognize the fact that the Nutcracker has no lyrics <laughs> but they invented lyrics. I should say she invented lyrics. Uh, yes. <laughs> since Lamb Chop was a puppet. Hush Puppy is the real middle child. Um, he makes peace between the older and the younger. Um, he is less secure than the others, plays by himself. Uh, he's a, a classic middle child. Lamb Chop is a classic third child, spoiled, indulgent. Charlie Horse is very much the older sibling. Charlie Horse is very much like me. I, I have to watch myself with Charlie Horse because he wants what he wants and he um, is very self-centered and self-focused. Uh, so, you know, that was my actually biggest connection other than just catching it here and there. And I hadn't thought about really Sherry Lewis or Lamb Chop for, for quite some time. Um, yeah, until you, until you mentioned that you were talking about it. So, so fascinating particularly the aspect of how long, I, you know, I never stopped to think about that, but how long that, that that's really been around, how long Sherry Lewis was really actively working and promoting that. So there's this, this great A&E biography. It's pretty much the, the core, my core component of audio pull for this particular installment. She really says up front in this biography thing, which aired just after she passed, that she knew that in order to have a long career in the entertainment field, she needed to reinvent herself. You know, she literally ha was surrounded by some incredible New York talent who guided her in her career and they wrote for her. And these were, you know, old shtick guys from the Catskills who were um, giving her the best corny humor that was family friendly. So she sort of turned herself into a, an early Madonna for children's for children's television, for, for simple humor, um, picking up perhaps where you might say Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy left off as America's premier puppeteer and ventriloquist. Chayefsky said, if you are going to have an enduring career, you have to be ready to go out of fashion a lot because nothing is consistent. And what happened was I replaced and pushed off the air, howdy doody, and cartoons namely chipmunks, replaced me and pushed me off the air. The, the richness of Sherry's impact, it feels to me, is number one, the fact that she was able to, to take it from the 50s, literally right when she was out of high school, all the way until almost the day she dropped. She had been diagnosed with uterine cancer, and within two months she had passed. And so my personal story on that is my kids were young at the time, uh, one born... Uh, who he would have been a, not even seven, and our daughter was uh, not even four. We get there is something in the newspaper. Sherry Lewis has been diagnosed with uterine cancer, and I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell my kids? I mean, ooh, uterine cancer, that's not good. Literally, I, like I hadn't even formulated it in a busy household, and then boom, two months later, she's dead. 
And and her entire empire kind of came to a screeching halt. The shows went off the air. um, There was no more marketing of DVDs. It it all just sort of ended, which it's sort of like a Prince thing, you know? I mean, when Prince passed and and all of a sudden you find out that his his, uh, entire business fortune was not as well planned out for his demise. Anyway, so we've sort of lost track of Sherry Lewis and the importance uh, and and her ability to bring stuff to kids today. Um, But she did a really good job from a very simplistic perspective of helping kids grow at the time when they need to, when they're four and five and six. And so to the degree that, um, and Dwight, feel free to jump in here at any point in time, where do kids get where do kids learn the most when they're four or five and six? Just about the the stuff that you need in life. Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing because uh, kids at that age are sort of identifying as a piece of the family. There's this whole study in psychology called object relations where we look at the way people relate to the outside world. And at that age, it, it, it's kind of that age where you don't really have uh, you don't really have friends with a specific identity. All of your friends are other short young people. And if they're short enough and young enough, we're friends and we're on the playground, we'll play. It, it's kind of that age where as a parent, if you see your kid playing with another kid and they say, oh, this is my friend. And you're like, oh, what's your friend's name? They're like, huh, what are you talking about? I don't care. You know, what, what does that mean? So, you know, you're kind of like one of these mass of, of little kids and you don't really identify outside the family. You're still also at that age where mom and dad or whoever the caretakers are, these big powerful creatures, and you kind of trust them as just all powerful. Um, And so then television entertainment actually plays a large role in that. Um, And and people have different feelings about this and and how much kids should consume media or whatever. But I think the reality is, is that most kids, particularly in a first world nation nowadays, are going to consume quite a bit of media uh, when they're young. And, And so... One of the things that I felt was very interesting in that biography, uh, the A&E biography, was when they talked about advertisers and television stations really turning their back on this age group, though, because while they do consume a lot of media, they are not viable consumers, nor can they motivate viable consumers. And so to really target audience, target an audience like that, to me, shows that there's some passion there and that there is an investment that obviously... Sherry Lewis and some of these other children's hosts must have had because it's not, no one's lining up to pay for preschool programming. Sure. And, and so Dwight and I were just getting reacquainted on the, on the call before we uh, started recording. And I said, so are your kids watching Saturday morning cartoons? And he said, well, with Netflix, every morning can be Saturday morning. And I would have said the same thing uh, 20 years ago, because with VHS, all of a sudden, a Tuesday morning could be a Saturday morning. You just threw in Lamb Chop's Haunted Studio, and you knew for 55 minutes. I mean, I could almost recite it by heart. We watched it so many times. There is that sense, I think, of, um, of familiarity, uh, not only with the characters, but to some degree with those kids growing up on DVDs and VHS, that they saw it, and they saw it, and and. It, as long as it was quality stuff, it was okay that it kind of got ingrained in them. So the VHS, the the capacity of the technology to really help parents curate a higher quality of, t- of television viewing than whatever was on on Saturday morning, or if they wanted to tape, you know, violate every copyright <laughs> law that there was to tape the series of Christmas specials that you might want to, sh- to show and have. I mean, that changed the the whole, the, the household dynamic with regard to kids, with regard to how parents wanted to ensure that what they their kids were seeing was good stuff. And PBS really ran with that. And also, uh, I think people trusted PBS to do the merchandising. So Sesame Street always did. The Children's Television Workshop had a merchandising component, which then exploded with Sherry and Barney and those guys. And um, so I guess coming back full circle to the initial conversation, Dwight, when your kids now via Netflix, which you can control, what do they watch and what do you, what have you guided them to as a parent? <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting because they find a lot on there just by scrolling around Netflix, make suggestions, Hulu as well, and all of those streaming platforms. So you have to, um, you know, in a way you have to be even more aware because when it was the days of VHS, you'd have that dynamic of watching the same thing over and over and over. Um, 
my kids have gone through different phases. My two-year-old right now is going through, you know, Curious George and Little Einsteins are the biggest things uh, for her right now. She'll kind of, then when she's at play, she'll sort of make little missions like they do on Little Einsteins. Or she has a stuffed Curious George and she'll kind of say, oh, you know, he's curious or whatever. Um, so that kind of also leads to some play that they will do as well. And it's been interesting to see my other two, who are 13 and 10, as they've evolved into doing a little bit more seeking out some of their own programming where they might uh, watch like the Lemony Snicket or they might go to watch like the animated Avatar series or something like that that's a little bit, um, not, not exactly mature viewing, but a little bit more grown up. Um, Just Add Magic is a wonderful little show with some preteen girls on Amazon that my, my 10 year old uh, daughter really likes. And so, you know, just kind of finding things that speak to them and to their experience. As you're talking about the VHS thing too, one of the things that occurred to me was, you know, uh, Sherry Lewis had a lot of, a lot more reinvention than I was aware of. I think nowadays with Netflix and all those things where we have, and YouTube and we have all this canned content, particularly because I don't know that anyone's, bird dogging the rights to her stuff very much. So a lot of it's on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You know, you see that and you're just used to content existing forever, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to actually hear how she had to go through a period of getting kicked off of television and then essentially having a stand-up comedy career for so many years before getting back on the television. Um, it was very interesting. And mm-hmm. it gave me a new appreciation watching some of these little bits that she does with Lamb Chop. When, uh, with that understanding that there was actually some some pretty solid uh, comedy, the comedy writers, uh, real comedians that were contributing to this uh, this material. Yeah, and and it feels to me that I mean when she so this A and E biography basically says when she recognized that there was a place on PBS for Lamb Chop and uh, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop and the gang, and she she brought it to them and she said we can you know we can make this we can bring this to the national audience. And they were, they just thought it was going to be more expensive. And she's like, no, this is, this is pretty basic stuff. So it was, um, it was a great luck, a point of luck that the NEA um, National Endowment for the Arts was really in a mode of quality television for children. There was a lot of pressure about merchandising and commercials and sugar cereal. You know, it was the late 90s, early 2000s, and people were starting to recognize the role of uh, how much uh, screen time, what, what the amount of screen time had in terms of an effect on kids. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating that when they they yeah. approached her with the idea of this is a shoestring budget she was like so yeah. <laughs> right and 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 i guess that also speaks to her desire or her belief that her material really is timeless uh, when when you see her interacting with charlie horse or charlie horse and hush puppy interacting with sherry not even in the picture they're they're kind of going through all of life's passages that you have whether you're five or seven or you're five years old and you've got a, a 10 year old brother um can and so as you were watching some of those did you have any thoughts about how those relationships are depicted and the accuracy and the timeliness or the the timelessness yeah i i I thought it was actually uh really well done like i said in a way the the comedy that she was able to tie into and the comedic timing it's funny and as we were talking about this episode uh we compare to kind of contemporaries and when we think contemporaries i think we're we're mostly thinking kids shows at the time right Uh, mr rogers captain kangaroo things like that as i was watching she actually reminded me more of uh of what I would put as a modern contemporary of hers would actually be someone more like Maria Bamford, who is decidedly more for an adult audience uh, as a stand-up comedian who's done, you know, she does lady dynamite on Netflix and things like that. And is very, very funny and poignant and very universal and has a way of relating things that you, that seem very human and very real. Um, and, and so that was interesting to see that and see, even though this is for a whole different audience that she has this strong comic timing. I bet you that you can't name, Ten animals from Africa. I can. No, I was talking to them. Can you name... T- I can. Uh, Lance, up, please. Can you name ten animals from... I can, I can, I can, and I will. Okay, good. Name ten animals from Africa. <sighs> there's... There's... Nine elephants and a giraffe. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I also was fascinated when she talked about 
the dynamic of those personalities, you could tell that these were really well fleshed out little puppets, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> when she, mm-hmm. uh, there's a bit, there is a bit in the biography where she talks about that uh, Lamb Chop is like the spoiled youngest baby child and Hush Puppy is the quiet middle child that can easily be lost or left behind. Um, but I was mostly fascinated when she said Charlie Horse is the the dynamic type A, like oldest child personality. And interestingly enough, which I, I always felt like Charlie Horse was a, there were times where I felt like Charlie Horse was kind of a phoned in voice because it sounded mostly like Sherry Lewis. Mm-hmm. But she actually said Charlie Horse is the most like me, which is very interesting to me considering that the voice sounds the most like Sherry Lewis to me, of uh, the other mm-hmm. voices. And she said that I have to be careful when I'm playing Charlie Horse because he's the most like me. I thought that was a very interesting way for her to say it. So there was obviously these component personalities that she was showcasing something very purposeful, but there was a little bit of her in each of those, I think. I agree with you totally. The other thing I guess I saw when she was describing that Lamb Chop is the classic younger child um, is that when when she engages with Charlie Horse, it's almost on a peer-to-peer basis. They are they are functioning at a little bit of a higher level. And when she's having a conversation with Lamb Chop, and Lamb Chop just sasses her back, that she she kind of levels Lamb Chop out. She she works her down a little bit from the panic or whatever, or the the assumption that she's drawn. And so it's a it, there's a tool to about parenting there too, where. Maybe that even as a parent was watching or listening or, you know, overhearing from the kitchen that you could understand how to have a fairly, fairly sophisticated conversations with children, in a sense, at three different levels. And, and we don't have that as much. I, I included in some of my examples back to you, probably something that aired while you were in, you know, getting your degrees and everything. There was something called Blue's Clues with Steve the uh, Steve, the human being, and then uh, a lot of animation and things. And so that, that ability to have an adult who is functioning at a level. And I, and I mean, Mr. Rogers kind of came across in that way, but I think Mr. Rogers pretty much talked to the camera, right? Yeah, very much. He was, uh, he was one-on-one with the child at home. Yeah. And, and Barney was uh, a big um, uh, mascot of sorts talking to kids. So this was really, in lieu of there being three real kids, Charlie Horse, Slam Chop, and Hush Puppy, they were they were totally within Sherry's control. And I think that there's just really some value to that that I, that we don't even recognize had had the value to the parents as well. There's a there was a whole appreciation that I got too when I was watching it is that they seem to react in some ways, although they're not human and, and obviously scripted and some things there they do seem to react more like kids in some. I mean, if you take the kids from uh, Barney, for example, even when my siblings were very young and Barney was on the air, we never, you couldn't really watch it without sort of, without watching it somewhat ironically, even as a kid, I think, <laughs> because uh, Barney's kids didn't talk like real kids. They, they were just like, okay, Barney, now we're going to. And they, they have these weird inside things that no one had ever heard of before. And, uh, it, it just struck me as like the un, the lack of realism there. And yet you've got these three little sock puppets, essentially, that, that seem to have more realistic uh, interactions with an adult. And I think that's kind of cool in a way. Horowitz also helped young people, especially boys on the edge of delinquency. His theory, which was then revolutionary, was that people learn more when they're being entertained. An ethic Sherry never forgot. So daddy learned his magic in order to seduce children to do math and chemistry. Um, He would teach them math magic, chemistry magic. If if somebody studied, he would give them puppets. And he developed way ahead of his time the concept that if kids are having fun, they're learning better. Yeah, I don't know how long a a sarcastic kid doing knock-knock jokes that are incredibly annoying to Barney, how long that would have lasted before somebody didn't get slapped. (laughs) Um, You know, and I I think about those knock-knock jokes and just the, 
it's just corny, but it's it's just regular, uh, simple humor that has to be understood in order for people, in order for young people to understand irony and and play with words. Uh, Sherry's early, you know, her her peers when she was first starting out her career were also puppet based. It was Kukla, Fran, and Ollie with. Uh, with Nanette Fabre being uh, the the ventriloquist of sorts, Howdy Doody, which just seems very black and white and two fifties for me, Captain Kangaroo. There were some puppets embedded in that show. I remember watching Captain Kangaroo when I was young, uh, but those were all male figures. You know, in all of Captain Kangaroo, it was all just a bunch of men. And then Romper Room, which. Um, was much more, it felt like, of a, of a classroom setting. It was like early, early childhood learning without, for the baby boom in particular, for kids who didn't have access to pre-kindergarten services and things. And so, so even early on, Sherry kind of carved out her, her niche and bless her heart that she was able to then kind of lay low, do Las Vegas of all things, and then, uh, and then come back and, and really stand alongside all of the big icons at uh, at PBS. Yeah, it really it really struck me. I wonder if that might be why she she didn't come to it like a children's show host acting like an adult child, like which I think is nowadays. If you watch even some of the Blues Clues, second guy more than the first guy. Um, I, Steve was the first one, I think. I don't remember the second guy's name, mm-hmm. but. Um, and then, you know, watch some of the modern ones like Imagination Movers was on for a while and some of those things where essentially a lot of the adults act like children themselves. Mm-hmm. And that is one approach to a children's show. But I really felt like when you watch Sherry Lewis interact with these puppets, she was acting like a grown up interacting with children in a very loving way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so more there's a more maternal or grandmotherly kind of relationship. And yet, like you say, there was some crossing that peer level, maybe more with Charlie Horse. And, and the other thing I thought was very interesting was the way that Lamb Chop would act as a foil to the act that they were doing. But she would also, I think, sometimes be a very useful tool. There was a clip in the biography when she's testifying to the FCC or talking in an FCC hearing. Mm-hmm. And she uses Lamb mm-hmm. Chop, which, you know, similar, similar to whoever plays Elmo, pulling Elmo out of the Today Show or Jim Henson being Kermit everywhere. Um everybody was kind of expecting it and she was able to make a few jokes and she was able to relate. But one of the things I thought was very interesting was Lamb Chop uh, commented, you're very nervous. How do you know that I'm nervous? Well, cause your palm is sweating <laughs> and she looks at her hand. No, it's not. And she says, no, the other one, which of course is a bit, you know, everyone laughs, mm-hmm. but yet at the same time that allows the person with the puppet to take a little bit of control of their own nervousness in this setting. Uh, so I wondered how much of that was was also her being able to relate emotions just in a different way. May Lamb Chop just say a word? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Come on, Lamb Chop. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> she did say so. <laughs> um, 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 where am I? Well, you're at the FCC. Oh, you, uh, well, how come you're nervous? I'm not nervous. Yes, you're nervous. How can you tell I'm nervous? Your palm is sweaty. <laughs> My palm is not sweaty. No, the other hand. <sighs> oh, oh, that lamb chop, what would you like to say? I would like to applaud the FCC for caring about children's television and making it better. I would like to applaud the FCC, too. No, no, no. No, let me do the applauding. Why? Because every time you clap your hands together, I black out. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> phenomenal i think how how bright sherry was with reading people with being able to connect with audiences and and bring humor along in a, in to appeal probably to many g- different generations and i think about i think about the fact that lamb chop sort of was her go to why was lamb you know of these three kids so to speak why was lamb chop the one female of the three why was she the youngest and why was she uh, sort of the the one who was the star of the three? And why didn't she pick, why didn't Lamb Chop become the second child with some more of those things? Because, you know, she could have easily uh, decided instead of having the sassy one, but maybe the sassy one feeds into more of a comic thing. And Hush Puppy is 
hush puppy is just the one that needs to get, I don't know, propped up or whatever. I, the, yeah. I just, I kind of wonder what's, what was going through their heads and why did they do that? And, and, and for girls watching, girls knew that Lamb Chop was a girl. And, and Sherry walked and talked Lamb Chop through a lot of situations where she told her she needed to stand up for herself. She needed to use her, her, her big girl voice, or she needed to not hit or do whatever she needed to do to, to meet the challenges of having two brothers. And, and I thought that that was just really valuable. And you would never have seen that on Barney or, or Mr. Rogers. Yeah, there's a bit uh, where it shows Lamb Chop talking about being afraid to change schools. Um, and they have that wonderful little conversation there. I think one of the reasons for her to focus on being the maybe the most different from her personality, at least in her own words, as she talks about Charlie Horse being the most like her, Lamb Chop would be the, the alternate. And that probably, number one, makes for good entertainment. But I think you're absolutely right, is that by having her own personality, uh, which, as, as she put it near the end, is that she never wanted to fit in and that she never felt anybody owed her anything. Uh, well, not, not, not so much that anyone owed her anything, but she just felt that no one was going to give her what she wanted. She had to make it happen herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a big independent streak. And so to play off of this very dependent, but yet... Dependent in some, I would say Lamb Chop's dependent in some ways like a child. And then on the other hand, it shows these bursts of independence and strength of personality, um, almost like someone who's being mentored, you know, and, and that mentoring then becomes a metaphor or a modeling experience for a lot of young viewers, particularly uh, young girls who are watching, who may not have that mentoring going on, you know, because contrary to Sherry's personality, I think there are a lot of young girls and women who were taught the very opposite, you know, be submissive, fit in at all costs mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. rock the boat. And it was Sherry every single day. Sherry was leading the songs. Sherry was teaching. Sherry was, was the only adult or the only person I think generally that you saw, unless she had some sort of a guest on. And I, I just think that that was a, a profound impression. And I don't necessarily see that you've, you've, you've maintained, or you've said mentioned a couple different shows that are available through various streaming services, but we don't have that presence today, at least on PBS. And that's kind of, well, and PBS isn't even available to everybody anymore, right? It's all on HBO. (laughs) Well, Sesame Street. Yeah. Sesame Street is. uh... Or Sesame Street. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. So the, the one other thing that, that listeners should know about Sherry Lewis, um, you know, she got her start in, uh, doing radio actually. And her father was a college professor and her mother was the music, uh, a music teacher for the New York public schools. And so there was a lot of entertainment in her family. Her family was very supportive of her career. Her father was the one who bought her her first uh, ven- ventriloquist doll or didn't buy it. Actually, he got it as a, as a barter for some services that he gave to a family. And so she started out much like Edgar Bergen uh, with his Charlie McCarthy, but then over the time, uh, her puppet morphed to uh, a sock puppet, and that was Lamb Chop. And so I suppose also to the degree that Lamb Chop was the first, maybe that's just where she has the most affinity, and it's uh, it was so different from everything else that was out there. It wasn't Howdy Doody. Um, but... Sherry did not go to college to become a teacher. She didn't major in elementary education. She doesn't have a degree from, you know, she didn't graduate from Juilliard. She did not have the training that you might expect of somebody today. Instead, it was all just homegrown. And when you think about the things that she brought, particularly to the the show from the 90s, uh, she was able to introduce a lot of young people to just... The, the fun things about learning. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit, Dwight and I are going to talk about the things that, that you'd find on a Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop show. And believe me, if you need 22 minutes of just feeling good about stuff or 26 minutes, I suppose, just cue up a, a Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop show because you're going to get to the end and you're going to have this, this rush of, of adrenaline, of endorphins that make you smile and make you realize that... Uh, it's all just, this is life. I don't know. Is that too philosophical, Dwight? <laughs> no, it's good. It is interesting because <laughs> there is a real energy there. I I found it very interesting to see how her father was a big proponent of using humor and entertainment to get people to learn. And of course, her mother was a singer. And well, what better 
combination of of those uh, attributes than than what what she became with her own career. It and it's interesting. We live in a world now where content creation, as I say, as a podcaster on another person's <laughs> podcast, we're both indie podcasts here. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, you could do a lot of content creation nowadays. And one of the things that I think is very interesting is individuals who I've known and worked with professionally, uh, who maybe because of disability or because of either physical or emotional limitations or financial, aren't able to seek out an education nowadays. Uh, many of them do turn to blogging, YouTubing, podcasting, even uh, some way to have an outlet for their interests. Because if I can't uh, become a zoologist, I can express and even create content or write about lots of different uh, things about animals. For example, if zoologist is what I said, I think that's the example I just said two seconds ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a little problem is you have to have a good enough memory to remember the metaphor you're using in the middle of it. I find sometimes that's a struggle, but you know, there's a lot of opportunities to do that. And it's interesting that she was a self-made content creator back in a day in which that was not very easy at all mm-hmm. because you had to talk people into it. You couldn't just start up your own YouTube channel um, <laughs> or, or, you know, start a podcast like you or I have and then have all the fame and fortune just come rolling in like we experience on a weekly basis. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Dwight, I'm going to put you on the hot seat and, and make you pull out all of your textbooks because you are the, you're the mental health uh, expert in this area. But I really felt that for people who maybe didn't raise kids in front of the Sherry Lewis VHS tapes, um, as, as I did, I found some big benefits and, and I'm hoping then that you can either speak from the mental health sort of good practices, uh, advice area of your kind of your delivery or else how, how this gets used in other sorts of therapy. But most importantly, if you've watched a single episode, you realize that singing was this huge part of every single show. And Sherry sang, she sang songs. They were clever songs. She sang in Lamb Chop's voice and Charlie Horse's voice. So she was incredibly talented. And then there was the song at the end of This is the Song That Does Not End. Very uh, iconic. So how does singing factor into children's mental health? And and what? Well, how do parents fit into that? I was, you know, first of all, I was going to warn you when you were doing research for this show to be careful because some people started singing that not knowing what it was. <laughs> and I think the the story I heard is that they'll keep singing it forever. So I didn't want you to get caught in that loop uh, forever. <laughs> <laughs> I walked right up to the edge. <laughs> <laughs> the edge of madness that is the song that never ends. I... You know, I, I think that there's a couple of things going on there. Um, if you were looking for what they call an earworm, which is a term that they often use applied to music, something that gets into your brain and that you want to keep repeating. Well, that's a, the definition of that is the song that never ends from Lamb Chop, I think, if you look in the dictionary. But so, so right away there's memory, right? Because setting something to some kind of a tune, it, it engages with your memory in a way because you're more likely to remember it because it has a rhythm to it. And that means whatever principles you're trying to get across can really, you know, be meaningful. Um, When there's something catchy and exuberant and exciting about it, I think that's one of the reasons people are cautious about the media their children consume, music included, uh, because it really does stay in their mind as a memory. Because of that, it also has a way of getting past defenses and defensiveness. Um, I think... And that's why maybe as an adult, we can watch it and say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm maybe not so much that last song, but the other songs, you really are listening. Okay, what comes next? I'm intrigued. I'm being carried along the rhythm of this uh, so that I might, if I'm just looking to have fun, I am enjoying myself and might actually then allow myself to start learning things. And you couple that with the memory. You know, and that that actually becomes very powerful. And from a, a parenting perspective, it, the idea that that parents should sing with their kids, even if it's in the car, even if it if you're throwing in some just some classic nursery rhymes set to music or a Sesame Street D, uh, CD or whatever. I mean, is that is that something that you work with families about to to bring them together with new common common ground, common language? I mean, it is an interesting thing because music can be very very bonding for relationships. Uh, sharing the music, especially as children, as I see with, with my kids that are a little bit older, as they start listening to some of the music that is on playlists that my wife or I have, have created, and they listen to some of the things that we do, 
um, my, you know, my 13 year old is in the process now where he selects some of his own music, uh, that, that he listens to, and that helps him to have a feeling of identity. And then I look at my two year old on the other extreme and, and you see little kids like that will generally, they'll just kind of start singing. Even when they're alone, you can hear them in the crib, waking up in the morning, kind of like, I'm going to get up now or whatever, <laughs> whatever they're doing. Uh, and that that's just a way that they're sort of narrating their, the things that are going on around them. And it, it becomes a way that there's a couple of different languages children speak. And I think song can be one of them. Uh, and, and play is another play and activity. Um, when you go, if you take a child to a classically trained play therapist, for example, they'll do a lot of game playing and, and playing with toys with a child. And, and that's actually very powerful because it allows the child to take some ownership and leadership of what they're doing. Uh, and so when I watch something like this, I, you could tell that there's a lot of uh, intelligence and a lot of, maybe a lot of intuitive smarts, but I, I would say whether or not, I don't know, you know where she studied or how she studied if she didn't have that, you know, the classical education, mm -hmm. but Sherry seemed to have a real knack for keying into that. Let's give kids something to do and something to sing, and then they can process their emotions uh, mm -hmm. in a more effective way. I, I think you're right. And, and that sort of, when you said give them something to do, crafts was often something that was featured, uh, eh, probably every other maybe, and not in her specials necessarily, but whether it's trying to do paper cutouts or making something out of a paper plate, which, you know, it was just sort of householdy kinds of things. So she was kind of helping them develop small motor. Is that, was that kind of your thought as you yeah, yeah, I think have that, tracked the, the things she had people do? I, I think so. I think they, I hadn't thought about it that way until you said it, but that does make sense. Um, the children are always developing finer and finer motor skills as they get older. And so it is good to have those activities. Also, Something that builds into it is also this idea of, of sharing the activity, um, not just sharing the activity, but taking turns and some of those kinds of things uh, that can be very effective. One of the things, too, is when you're using something that is entertaining is that it can help kids to hook into paying attention to something. And that could even go so far as to help out kids with ADHD or ADD, um, even mm -hmm. kids on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. who might have a really hard time focusing on something purposefully, particularly if it's dry, um, they'll, you know, the old joke about ADHD is that it doesn't really mean you can't pay attention. You just can't pay attention to things you don't like. And so uh, yes. that this can be a way to engage with that because there's an automatic pull if it's entertaining, if, and if it's engaging and fun. Well, and, I, and as I think about that whole repetition point that you and I made earlier or discussed earlier, so if you watched, if you popped in the VHS and it was all of a sudden a, a paper plate uh, flower that was getting made and cut, well, you might, as a parent, you might not have said, oh, I need a paper plate. I need to get my child, you know, the kid scissors, and I probably need to even be there to help. Instead, this kid with no supplies might have sat in front of the TV and watched the process happen, watched it again, maybe. I, I don't know that my kids ever actually sat and did it along with her, but they definitely watched a process and they followed, they could see kids following instruction. And there was a, I think that sends a really powerful message about how you make something. It's not just given to you. And, and I, I'm starting to grow concerned that we've lost that a little bit. Yeah. We've consigned it to teachers. It, yeah. it is. It is interesting. I think part of that too is not just, it's easy to say like, Oh, we've lost interest or we have too many distractions, but, um, I think that one of the things that has happened, this is kind of in connection with what we mentioned earlier, Sesame Street, mm -hmm. no longer funded enough to be on PBS, right? It has to uh, mm -hmm. have a, luckily, there's some, uh, HBO stepped in to kind of keep it alive, but then of course they want some ownership mm -hmm. of it too, and you don't know where that's going to end. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our world has become, in my mind, very productivity obsessed, where sitting and cutting a paper plate up into a flower you know, that's nothing that's going to look good on a resume later. Or that's nothing that's going to help raise standardized test scores. And, you know, and, and realistically, it, it's, it's interesting because I see things like, uh, oh, I don't know, I just see extracurricular programs for academics. My son was involved in, in a science competition recently and talking to some parents at some schools around here, they find that some school administrators actually actively discourage classes from participating in things like that because they don't have a measurable effect on the test scores of the school, for example. Mm. Uh, 
Yeah. So there, I think there's things like that. It'd be easy to just blame parents like we do, but we can also blame society too and say, you know, there's right. such a an expectation, cost of living going up. Do people have the time and energy to remember to sit down and cut up a paper plate? Yeah. <laughs> a little doom and gloom. But... And if she hadn't passed in 1998, you have to wonder whether or not Sherry would be testifying or would have testified in the last 10 years about all the changes to education and the and the step back from some of the these fundamentals that that are the building blocks of development of of being able to follow rules of being able to understand a process and and achieve that sense of satisfaction when you have completed making the paper plate flower but anyway um and then I- it's really true I, one thing i wanted to say about that though uh, is that i know that she passed in the, in the late 90s but I think this is something we could learn from. She makes a comment in an interview where uh, she talks about the kids of today. Everything has to happen quickly. They have shorter attention spans. And then she added, and isn't it wonderful? They're like me now. Like, that's how I am. <laughs> and she's like, so it's easier for us to talk. And you can totally use that to teach them, mm-hmm. which I felt like that is an attitude that I think anyone who works with kids, parent, educator, anybody um, to keep in mind is that don't hate them for being younger and different than you are. Mm -hmm. I hear so many hating on millennials nowadays and I work with a lot of young people and I find that many of them are, uh, are wonderful. They're really hard workers that they have the capacity to use technology really well to find out what they want to do with their lives. And yeah, they have some concerns and their generation has some, some characteristics that people don't love uh, and, and all that. But I just, I feel like most of them are actually trying really hard. Well, we are uh, we're getting a little close to the end of our interview. The other areas that that I had called out that I thought that Sherry did a good job of bringing into all of these interactions that the three puppets had with each other and sometimes with Sherry had to do with really um, establishing and understanding that humor has a has a place, what humor is. And for a four-year-old to appreciate a good knock-knock joke is kind of essential, or at least it was in my family. Um, and that handling emotions, and that's one that I'm hoping Dwight, you can talk about a little bit more. And then also the sibling interactivity and just where without, without kids seeing that necessarily on TV, or maybe they do see it. How, how do they, how are they counseled through a more positive, um, handling of their emotions and one where they feel like they're, they're able to see it, see it being modeled is TV providing that today? I, I think it depends what you watch. I think there are a lot of good things out there. Um, the, the biggest thing to emphasize with processing emotions is firstly having a good vocabulary, naming them, knowing what they are, uh, talking about them. So I think, I think you see more of that. You see a lot of drama that's being played out. I think there's the opportunity to see where someone's actually writing. And that's where... Oh, I don't know. Even even watching something as simple as little Curious George cartoons. I'll throw that one out there because, you know, of the obsession of my two-year-old. <laughs> or the the way that they structure, uh, the way that they structured Phineas and Ferb, for example, with little uh, adventures and trying to do things that don't have anything to do with uh, fighting any monsters necessarily or anything like that, but have to do with kind of being smart and thinking through problems. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of those things are strengths of things that are made nowadays. Uh, and then... The other things that I won't get specific with negative examples, but mostly because we gravitate away from them probably, so they may escape me, but just the ones that are just kind of silliness that are just sort of like, oh, this is just barely better than a babysitter, you know, <laughs> that you have mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in front of the kid. I, I will throw out one more that's a good example, which is Daniel Tiger, which is the modern iteration of Mr. Rogers in a way. Um, it has a lot of the characters. It's made by PBS, I believe, and, and it has some of the characters from Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Um, the hero is this Daniel tiger. Who's a little boy going to school and a uh, little boy tiger, I should say. Uh, and, and they actually have speaking of music. They use little songs to sing about how you feel or to sing about, it's okay to try new foods. It's okay to be scared. And I think the best message for kids to receive about emotion is that it's okay. It is okay to feel whatever you feel. Uh, and that there is a relationship between what you feel and what you do, but you have to kind of think about that. You can't, it's okay to be mad, for example, but not to hit, you know, that just those simple lessons. And I see, I see that being explored 
in, in some places. Excellent. Well, and, and perhaps those are some of Sherry's legacies. Perhaps she really did write the book. She kind of created some best practices in the in the series, the series that she did primarily in the 90s. So it's the color versions. If you're watching on YouTube and you're looking around at some of those black and white ones, I don't think you're going to see nearly the sophisticated level. I think you're going to see more of the rudimentary uh, kind of classic humor that, uh, you know, it, it took her a while to develop her shtick and also feel comfortable with the, the kind of the curriculum she was providing very subtly to her viewers. I think that that's a, also a, a credit to her creativity as a person and as a creator, as mm -hmm. a performer, because at the time, and even, you know, Mr. Rogers went through this where it was this radical notion of saying, well, what are we going to do with a children's show? I guess it's like a preschool class or a Sunday school class almost that you do for kids. We're just going to put a camera in front of it. And people like Fred Rogers, or I would say Sherry Lewis, maybe even a little more aggressively, uh, were saying, no, we can do different things with this format that you can't do anywhere else. And they really saw the vision of what uh, television could be in a way that promotes emotional health. It's a, it's, it's just, it's a fascinating thing to think about. And I honestly, when I knew I wanted to do something a, uh, kind of in honor or in tribute to Sherry Lewis and her impact, I didn't really have the sense of what that was going to look like or sound like. But I think you and I have really, um, really drilled down and we have kind of determined what her legacy is. And that legacy was only born out of her understanding that she needed to reinvent herself and keep a good eye on what kids of that moment needed. Um, uh, young people growing up in the 50s and 60s were very different than than my kids who watched her really as she uh, was in her renaissance. And, and as she passed, she was getting ready to take it to Broadway. So she was uh, really mastering multiple platforms. And it's, um, it's America's loss that she passed at, uh, in her mid sixties in 1998 and, and left things in such a way that uh, that the longevity is not there. I, you know, we don't really have that many shows, children's shows where you watch reruns. It's not like Hogan's heroes, which will live on forever. Can you think of, I mean, how, how I wonder what, why that is. Maybe, maybe because everything, uh, I don't know. Everything's so story arc based nowadays. Um, so that you kind of feel like you lived it once, you know, it's like a, a lot of TV shows are like long movies now, yeah. uh, even comedies, which I actually, you know, I enjoy that, but it doesn't make me necessarily want to go jump back in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My kids would tell me, I, I really made them learn. They, they kind of got a full sample of stuff from my childhood as well as uh, a lot of opportunity to explore what was available on VHS. And there was some great stuff uh, in the, in the nineties. Uh, Shelley Duvall was doing a series that was available on VHS. VHS was really the, the way to, to curate for your children, uh, high quality programming. And there seemed to be a budget out there because people had to either buy it or rent it. And now you get, you know, now you're trying to slime it for free. But I also made them watch the uh, Grammar Rock, History Rock, America Rock, I guess is what the full series was called. And that was left over from the early 70s or mid 70s. So there's good stuff out there. And I guess uh, from a women in in and of TV perspective, I would only say that unfortunately, it still feels like even the material that's coming up today is predisposed to having a strong male lead, whether that's a young man or an animated man or an old man, um, uh, as the, as the voice, as the main character and, and what that means for young women today and girls and their mothers, uh, remains that challenge that we face at every corner, um, trying to bring TV to a point of, uh, enhancing confidence and making girls realize that they can be anything they want to be. So I think Sherry helped us, uh, realize that entertainment and teaching was a noble profession and bless her heart. Dwight, any, any conclusions about Sherry Lewis and what your kids are going to watch this afternoon? <laughs> no, it's, uh, really good. Just, uh, yeah, YouTube it and see, I think, people would be surprised uh, at how much it can hold up. It, it really is timeless. So I'm hopeful that when, you're, when your two-year-old becomes three, maybe you, uh, you, know, you slide in a little sherry every once in a while and uh, 
Lamb Chop and the Haunted Studio, we still quote that in our family today. So um, I appreciate the time you've taken this morning to help us better understand sort of that real fundamental aspect of children's programming and how Sherry brought it to life. And wish you well as you uh, continue to find new content and ways to bring The Broken Brain, your podcast, to your listeners. I think, thank you. Thanks for your help. Thanks so much. It's been an honor to be here. I am so glad Dwight Hurst was able to join me for this discussion. Again, Dwight's podcast is called The Broken Brain and can be found on iTunes or Libsyn, which is actually where you'll find both of us right there at Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. One more important bit of information about the fantastic Sherry Lewis, rest her soul. In her 40 plus year career, her work was recognized with 12 Emmys. Her peers knew just how talented she was. Learn more about her life and work by watching the A&E Arts and Entertainment Network's biography show on Sherry. You can find it and all sorts of TV shows from throughout Sherry's career on YouTube. Otherwise, there's just, there aren't that many places where you can learn about her. Her sudden passing in 1998 occurred at the time when, perhaps within her career, she was being asked to write her memoir. We'll never know. If you have kids or grandkids in your life, however, I would say it is high time that you share a little lamb chop with them. Thanks for listening to Advanced TV Herstory. Send your comments and ideas for future installments or your hackneyed knock-knock joke to us at Advanced TV Herstory, that's all one word, at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at TV Herstory, or if you only have time to read scripts, and I'm sorry, there are no transcriptions of excellent interviews like the one you've just heard, but find scripts and a built-in player at www.tvherstory.com. It's very simple to be able to listen to this show. Dwight Hurst and I are two of many podcasts that are, in a sense, herded like cats on our network, Core Temp Arts where you'll find other independently produced shows that talk about TV, movies, pop culture, and life. Find us all at www.coretemparts.com. And as always, many thanks to David Brown for editing this interview with the precision of a surgeon. Now, listeners, Women in TV and this one particular woman, Sherry Lewis, had a huge, huge impact on my family. So thinking a bit more deeply about how she changed and really stood for quality children's television is my way of honoring her great work. It's why I podcast. And maybe, just maybe, it's why you listen. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. So long for now. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.